a lot of people think that the Irish come across here because of work, economics, or even relig religious persecution. It's got nothing to do with that. The reason we come to your country is because over here, you're a permissive society. In Ireland, we're not. Here, you have sex before marriage. In Ireland, we do not. We come to get our share. <laughs> The Irish are very good at populating other countries. <laughs> In more ways than one. <laughs> so for all you know, you might be laughing at your brother. <laughs> you know, two Irish fellows talking about sex before marriage, and one tells the other, he said, what do you think about sex before marriage? He said, I don't think about it. <laughs> he said, well, I know I never had sex with my wife before we were married. Did you? He said, I have no idea. What's her name? I, I am what you would... Uh what you would, might call a practicing atheist. <laughs> I'm, I'm quite happy to be an atheist because I think actually God likes atheists better. We never ask him for anything. We're not bothering him all the time saying, oh God, please help me, I'm a this thing. <laughs> and as a practicing atheist, there's certain things that <clears throat> I travel around the world and no matter where I go, somebody called Gideon leaves me this book to read. <laughs> It's an Irish book because it says it all began at the beginning. <laughs> there, are certain, there are certain things that, <clears throat> when I read the Bible, and I do read the Bible, that, that I find difficult to understand. I mean, if God has been there forever, what was he doing before he got to us? <laughs> I mean, what was he out there doing? Was he sitting there going... Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> bored today, what did I do? And then suddenly from nowhere, he suddenly decided to create a world. I'll make a world, that's what. Make a world. Yes, that's what I'll do. Rivers, seas, boom, mountains. Boom. Everything's there. I want a garden. I'd like a nice garden. Quack! Garden me. Hate gardening. <laughs> Need a garden. Ah, garden. Spit and dust. Adam. Hey! And he, Adam, never once says, where in the name of God did I come from? <laughs> I mean, he's 40 years of age. He has no child, he has no recall. He doesn't say, how did I get here? But he's quite happy. He just kind of trundles around the garden, working away. And God is looking at him. And he sees that animal's happy. put him there to be happy. <laughs> I'll put a stop to that. <laughs> and God, during the night, sneaks down like a thief and steals, doesn't ask, doesn't request, doesn't, steals it, his rib. <laughs> and from his rib, he makes woman. And Adam wakes up in the morning, he's a real thicky. <laughs> he's lying there, he's saying, and there's somebody else, he doesn't say, where did you come from? <laughs> where, how the hell did you get here? Where did, you, where did you get those lumps? <laughs> Just goes out and goes gardening. <laughs> and God comes down and has a conversation with Eve and tells her that she can eat of any fruit in the tree in the whole garden with the exception of one fruit tree. He's talking to a woman. <laughs> he actually tells her not to eat of the fruit. And then when she says, which tree can't I eat? He said, that one over there. He points it out to her. <laughs> and when he goes and hides, and she sneaks up to the tree, and a snake comes down and has a conversation. A snake. Now, if I see a snake, I'll back off. <laughs> One starts talking, I'll crap myself. <laughs> and the snake actually convinces her to eat the apple. And she eats the apple. And when she eats the apple, she learns shame. That's what happens when you eat apples. <laughs> Now, she's not ashamed that she's disobeyed God or that she's eaten the apple. She's ashamed of one here, one part of her body. That's all. She becomes ashamed of that area of the body. 
Now, why that area? Why not her elbow? <laughs> her nose. Do, do you actually realize that if Eve had been ashamed of her nose, every woman in the world now would be ashamed of your noses? You'd all be sitting here tonight with little nose knickers on. <laughs> Men would be in nightclubs watching totally naked ladies with G-strings on the nose. <laughs> Take them off. Oh, I saw a nose. <laughs> and this is the book. This is the book that you'll go into court and place your hand upon. <laughs> and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth. Hand back to you. A very important part of the Irish way of life is death. <laughs> See, if anybody else, anywhere else in the world dies, that's the end of it, they're dead. But in Ireland, when somebody dies, we lay them out and watch them for a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> Call a wake. And it's a great, it's a party, it's a send-off. And the fellow's laid out on the table. And there's drinking and dancing and all the food you can eat. And all your friends come from all over the place. And they all stand around the wake table looking at you with a glass in their hands and they say, here's to your health. <laughs> and the terrible thing about dying over there is that you miss your own wake. <laughs> it's the best day of your life. You've paid for everything and you can't join in. <laughs> Mind you, if you did, you'd be drinking on your own. <laughs> we have love. We have a custom, we have a custom that the dying man is allowed one question before he dies which must be answered completely truthfully, otherwise the soul is damned. And you get a little fella dying, and he's got four sons, three of the biggest fellows you've ever seen in your life, and one skinny little puny, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> and he's lying there and he's going, Mary, Mary, are you there, darling? Are you there? She goes, I'm here, love. I'm here beside you. I'm gone. I'm gone. She says, I know. Don't hang about now. <laughs> Mary, before I go, I'm going to ask you the question. Tell me now. Tell me. Is that skinny little runt standing at the end of the bed? Is he really my son? <laughs> she says, he is. Honest to God, he is your son. And he goes, <coughs> <laughs> And she goes, thank God he didn't ask about the other three. <laughs> There's no doubt that some men are born with a power power to control or a power to lead or a power to sway other men. And no man more so than the man who has the power of hypnosis. The hypnotist can not only sway one mind, but many minds, thousands of minds. And there's a story told of a hypnotist who appeared at the Albert Hall. The place was packed, thousands of people. And he walked upon the stage and all the lights went down and he stood in the one spotlight. And he began to talk, and his voice was soft and gentle, persuasive. And as he talked, the people listened. And as they listened, they became immersed in the sound of his voice. And he said to them, you will listen to my voice. You will listen, and as you hear my voice, your eyes will become drowsy. Your limbs will become heavy. Your eyelids will become sand-like. You wish to close. You wish to sleep. And as you sleep, you shall listen to my voice. And they're all there. <laughs> <laughs> you will obey my every command. <laughs> the whole place is still. 
He said, I will leave the stage now for a few moments, but I want you to remember that you are under my control. And as he leaves the stage, he trips over a microphone wire <laughs> and says a word which I am not allowed to say on television. <laughs> I only know that it took five weeks to clean the Albert Hall out. <laughs> I was talking to a man the other day who was leaving, decided to immigrate, decided to leave this country. And I said, why are you leaving? He said, it's homosexuality. I said, what are you talking about? He said, 300 years ago, if you were homosexual, you were hanged, drawn, and quartered. A hundred years ago, if you were homosexual, you were hanged. Fifty years ago, if you were homosexual, you were flogged and given 20 years in prison. Twenty years ago, if you were homosexual, you were fined 200 pounds and sent to prison for two years. Five years ago, if you were homosexual, you had a small fine and you were pardoned. Got off with a warning. I said, well, what are you leaving for? He said, I'm gone before they make it compulsory. <laughs> the Pope, discussing the existence of God with an out-and-out -out atheist, starts off very correctly, discussion and as the hours go by, it gets more and more heated, and eventually the Pope turns to the man and he says, The mom! Get the mom! And you, come here. Yeah. <laughs> you are like a man who is totally blindfolded in a dark room looking for a black cat that is not there. <laughs> Well, so we're all respect your holiness, I think there's great similarity between us both. He said, what do you mean, similarity? He said, well, as far as I'm concerned, you are like a man who is blindfolded in a totally dark room looking for a black cat that isn't there. The only difference is that you found it. <laughs> but a nun gets up in the morning and leaves and walks down the corridor. And another nun looks at her and says, it's a difficult thing to say, I'm not a nun. <laughs> and says, you got out of the wrong side of the bed this morning. <laughs> and she goes on down, and another nun says, you got out of the wrong side of the bed this morning. And this happens 15 times, and by then she's livid. And she meets the Mother Superior. And the Mother Superior is just about to open her mouth, and the sister says, don't tell me that I got out of the wrong side of the bed this morning. <laughs> And the Mother Superior said, I wasn't going to say that. I was just going to say, what are you doing with the bishop's shoes on? <laughs> Final custom that we have in Ireland regarding death and the funeral is that only one person who is buried in a graveyard can go to heaven. Which basically means if two people are buried in the same graveyard, on the same day, the last one in has got to wait till tomorrow. <laughs> so can you imagine what would happen if one funeral met another funeral going to the same graveyard? <laughs>